have your Bible tonight. You got your Bible close to you there at home or wherever you might be. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 14 this evening, if you would please. John chapter 14. And I want you to uh, follow along with me as we uh, make our way as quickly as we can in the next few minutes that we have together through this 14th chapter of John. Uh, I might just remind you that uh, John 13 through 17 are all part of what is called the Upper Room Discourse. And that simply means that the, the, this is the last uh, time that Jesus met together with his disciples prior to his crucifixion. So these are important uh, chapters, and uh, they're, they're important truths that Jesus is imparting to his uh, 12 disciples. And uh, it begins, he, he observes the Passover. Isn't, isn't it interesting that this Saturday night at sundown begins the Passover, the week of Passover celebration for the Jewish people? Well, this is Jesus' last Passover. Uh, with his 12 disciples prior to his death. And in chapter 13 and verse 33, he gives them the sad news. He says, yet a little while I am with you. You'll seek me, as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. And so they're sad because of that. He mentioned that he was going to be going away. And it resulted in what he addresses in chapter 14, where I had you turn, and verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. He said he was going away, and it brought their hearts to be troubled. Question, how can Jesus leave the twelve and at the same time say what he does just before he goes back to heaven in Matthew 28 and verse 20, where he says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. How can he leave them and, and yet at the same time be with them? Well, Jesus' physical absence during this present time that you and I are living in ought not to be something that should trouble us. It ought to be something that should not cause us sadness, but all, really ought to be a reason for us to rejoice. And if you know why Jesus departed, if you know why he had to go away, you won't be troubled in heart. You'll be very glad in heart. And so I want to share with you, beginning uh, with uh, the first uh, verses 2 and 3, the purpose for which Jesus had to go away and is not present in body with us here this evening. But let's, uh, let's pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we have together. And I just pray that our brief study of your word tonight would, would just uh, be very uh, reassuring and uh, comforting and, uh, and would uh, be... Uh, empowering to us as we not only recognize but we believe these truths. Uh, these are precious truths that you shared with your disciples. May we get a hold of them and may it make a major difference in our lives this evening and going forward in Jesus name. For his glory we pray it. I want you to look at verses 2 and 3 because here is the purpose for him telling them that I have to go away and them being troubled unnecessarily. Look at, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Why is Jesus going to be going away? Well, the purpose that he gives us here is that he is going to prepare a place. So, basically, Jesus is saying to these disciples, tomorrow I'm going to be crucified. Tomorrow I'm going to, be, I'm going to die. Why? Because I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Three days later, I'm going to resurrect from the tomb. Why? because I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
40 days later after his resurrection, he ascends up into the clouds on his way to heaven. He disappears out of the... Why? Because he's going to prepare a place for them. Well, yes, he's going to prepare a place for them, but in the meantime also, what is he doing? Listen to these verses as I read them to you tonight, and I hope that you'll see that Jesus isn't up there just preparing a place for us. He's involved in other things too. Listen to these verses. I'm reading from Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He, God, who spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even ascended, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So he's in heaven. He went away. He departed to prepare a place for us, but he is also interceding for us. He is, that when you realize, when you realize that, when you realize that he's at the right hand of God interceding for his people, for believers, then you know what? His going away is good news. <laughs> it's actually good news. But not only is he interceding, as we read there in John 14, 2, where I've had you turn tonight for those that just came in, he's preparing for us. And it says he's preparing for us, notice, mansions. Now, the word mansions is the root word that is translated abide in the next chapter, in chapter 15. And so mansions literally are abiding places. They're abiding places for believers to eternally live in the New Jerusalem. We're going to have dwelling places. We're going to have houses that we dwell in eternally in that city called the New Jerusalem. And that's what he has gone, he said, to prepare for us. Hey, that's good news. And that's something to rejoice in and not be troubled because Jesus has gone away from us. And he's not here in bodily presence. That's the purpose for him going away. But I want you to look with me in John 14 again. And in uh, the verses that follow, I want you to see the place, the place where he went away to. If you'll note in that uh, uh, second verse, he calls it his father's house. And in verse 3, he goes to his father's house to prepare a place for us. So, where is Jesus? Well, very clearly, he's departed, and he's gone to his Father's house, wherever that is. We call it heaven, I guess. But he has gone, that's good news, that he's gone to his Father's house. That's ultimately the destination, to his Father's right hand. That's what we just read in Romans chapter 8. That when he left this earth and ascended to his father's house, when he got there, he sat down on the right hand of the father. He sat down on the throne of God. He sat down on the right hand of the father. That's his ultimate destination in his father's house. And uh, it answers the question as to the location uh, of where Jesus is. During this, what is called the church age, from the, uh, the ascension of our Lord until he returns for us to take us to be with himself, guess where he is? The place where he is is in his father's house, 
and specifically he is located at the father's right hand or if I could put it in another term he's enthroned he's sitting on the throne at his father's right hand and you know why he does that again referring back to Romans chapter 8 those verses we just read there he freely gives us all things there he gives us things that previously were unavailable to God's people there he sits on the right hand of God as our mediator you know what a mediator is someone that uh, stands between two people or two persons in this case it is Jesus who stands between us and the Father and he mediates before the Father at the Father's right hand on our behalf he ever lives that verse says to intercede for us to speak on our behalf to the Father that's a good thing that's not something to be troubled in heart that he's gone away because he's gone away for a good purpose to a good place to intercede for us now, I want you to note with me in the sixth verse because Thomas he, he says Lord we don't know where you're going he just told him I'm going to my father's house we don't know where you're going we don't know the way there Jesus answer you know this verse verse 6 what does Jesus say basically he says when he what he says I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me he he is saying that he himself is the exclusive way to God to the Father. Now those of you that don't know him as your very own personal Savior from sin and the condemnation that sin brings upon you, if you have Jesus, if you have received Jesus, you have the way to the Father. You have entrance into the Father's house and so Jesus says he's the exclusive way to the Father and uh, as our mediator there at the right hand of God the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that after he purged our sins he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high and uh, he he mediates for us in that same book Hebrews chapter 7 I think it's verse 25 he ever lives uh, uh, to save us to the uttermost he saves us to the uttermost he secures our eternal salvation in fact John tells us in his first epistle he says my little children I write these things unto you that you sin not but if any person sins any believer sins I want you to know this we have an advocate with the Father we have someone that stands up for us, mediates on our behalf before the Father's throne. That's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He advocates on our behalf because he can do so, for he is the righteous one. And that righteous one puts his righteousness on our account so he can then legally advocate for us so Jesus secures our eternal salvation so John in his gospel back in chapter 10 says that if you're a believer you're in God's hands and if you're in God's hands you're in good hands and you're doubly secure because you're in Jesus's hands and the Father's hands in God's hands and no one or nothing shall ever be able to pluck you out of his hand say that's what he says and then if you'll uh, look down with me another one of the disciples pipes up Philip in verse 8 and he says Lord show the Father to us and, th and that that'd be enough just show us the Father and Jesus laments in verse 9 he says Philip have I been so long with you and yet you don't you haven't known me 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What do you mean, show us the Father? Look at me. I reveal him. How can you say, show us the Father? Philip, I've been with you for three years and you, don't, you haven't figured this out yet. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words, verse 10, that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. The works that I do are the result of the Father. It's his works that I'm accomplishing, not mine, it's his. I'm here to do his will. And then look at the startling verse 12. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, John 14, 12, he that believeth on me, he that depends upon my words, he that depends upon my power, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now get what he's saying here. Here he's telling us, that because he's at the right hand of God as our mediator, he not only is the ex exclusive way to the Father and secures our eternal salvation, but he empowers us to do the miraculous. That the Christian life is a supernatural life in which Jesus empowers us to do miracles. That's what he's saying here. And not only that, look at verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If she, ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So where's Jesus? Well, his ultimate destination is the Father's house. And his specific location there is on the throne at the right hand. And there he, he, he becomes the exclusive way of salvation. He secures our eternal salvation. He empowers us to do miracles. And in verses 13 and 14, he answers, he answers unlimited prayer. If you ask on his behalf, if you ask in his name. Now, you can search, the, listen to me, you can search the Bible through and look at all the prayers in the Bible. I'll guarantee you, you'll never find a single prayer in the Bible that ends with these words, in Jesus' name, amen. That's our doing. We don't understand. We don't understand what he means when he says, you pray the Father in my name. What he is see, saying is, you ask the Father on my behalf and I will authorize your request. In other words, you have a new power to pray. Unlimited. If you pray prayers that I authorize, Jesus is saying, it's going to happen. It's no, I think so, or I hope so, it will happen. Just be sure Jesus authorizes the prayer and you can claim it. And this is what he's saying here. So that's where he is. And that's why he's there. And his position, of course, as we've said, is he's enthroned. And because he is enthroned, he validates the ministry of the third person of the triune God, and that is the Holy Spirit. Through his enthronement, the ministry of the Holy Spirit happens. And uh, there are three things that he says about the Holy Spirit's ministry in the verses that follow. I want you to look with me in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. You know what the Christian life is? The Christian life is about loving Jesus and keeping his commandments. You know, I've discovered, and perhaps you have too, 
that if you love someone, you desire to make that person happy by doing what they want, by pleasing them. Did you know that's what love is? Husbands, they exist to find out what pleases their wives and doing it. In fact, I've had that kind of stuff put to me by my wife. Well, if you really loved me, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't do that because, you know, I don't like it. Okay, that makes sense. It's pretty simple. If you love someone, you don't want to do something that uh, they don't like. You want to do what they like. You want to make them happy. You want to please them, right? That's all he's saying here in verse 15. If you truly love the Lord, you're going to find out what makes him happy. You're going to find out what he's pleased with, and you're going to want to do that. It's a relationship, a love relationship. But here's the kicker. It's impossible to do that in and of yourself. It's impossible if you're depending upon yourself to keep his commandments and thus show that you really love him. Ah, what do we do? Look at verse 16. Here's the answer. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be with you forever. Okay. It's a love relationship. This relationship, in order for it to function as a love relationship, where you please the person that, uh, that you love, where you do his commands, and if you can't do it in your own strength, then you need help. And that's what verse 16 is. You have this relationship happens through partnership. And this partnership is with, with, with someone who is called the Comforter. Notice that a capital C in verse 16. And that word Comforter is a word that means literally someone that is called alongside you to assist you or to help you. Here's what it means. If you're going to please the one that you love, if you're going to please the Lord that you say you love, you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in self-dependence. That relationship can only be can only be bolstered and uh, and established and, and kept through a partnership. And your partner is none other than the Holy Spirit. He's the one. The Holy Spirit will give you the ability to do God's will. The Holy Spirit will give you the supernatural ability to keep Jesus' commandments. The Holy Spirit will empower you to do that. That's what he's promising there in that 16th verse. That he would give you, notice this, another comforter. In other words, Jesus is saying, I was your comforter. I was the one that the Father sent to be alongside of you, to assist you, to help you. But now I'm going away, and so I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm, that word another means one of the same kind, one just like me. I'm going to send you the same kind of comforter that I was to you. Jesus says, I'm going to re be replaced. I'm going to be replaced. I was with you all of these three years, but this, another comforter, is going to not only be with you, he's going to be in you. Look at verse 17. The Comforter is defined here in verse 17 as the Spirit of Truth, whom the world can't receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be what? See, Jesus was dwelling with them, but he couldn't be in them. The Holy Spirit, another Comforter, of the same kind as Jesus, he's going to replace Jesus, and he's not going to only be with them, he's going to be in them. And uh, 
uh, the, Jesus at the Father's right hand, right now he's sitting at the Father's right hand, but the Holy Spirit, you know where he's sitting? He's sitting on the, I hope, on the throne of your heart. Jesus is on the throne of the Father's right hand, but the Holy Spirit, his rightful place is to sit on the throne of the believer's heart. He's to be the Lord of your life. He's the one that you surrender your whole body to, as Romans 12, 1 says. Hey, has it dawned on you that it's good news that Jesus left? We have a closer relationship with God than we ever had when Jesus walked this earth. But it's all because of what Jesus did in his work on that cross, his resurrection, his ascension, his enthronement at the right hand. That all brings about this presence and this position. Now look at uh, what he closes with as we end up here. He says uh, in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will, I will come to you. You know how he comes to you? Yet a little while, verse 19, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And at that day, that day being the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent down by Christ from the throne, in that day, he says, at that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. See? And he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Here he's talking about his presence. Notice, the Holy Spirit coming to you makes God's presence real to you. Jesus departing is really good news. And to experience Jesus' presence in an amazing way required him to be taken from us. And when he's taken from us, he sends the Holy Spirit, another comforter, to take his place, to not only be with us, to, but to be in us. And the Holy Spirit coming to you is Jesus coming to you. And by the Holy Spirit, he reveals himself to the dedicated believer in a spiritual way, but a real way, is what we've just read. How does he do that? Look at verse 23 again. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, that is, the Father and Jesus, the Son, will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. See the word abode? It's the same word translated mansions in verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions, or abodes, or abiding places. So when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, which he did, at that day, which is the day of Pentecost, so did the Son of God and God the Father. They joined to make the presence of God known to you, and it results in you knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus' instruction. Look at verse 25 and 26. These things have I spoken to you that be present, uh, present with you yet, but the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You know what he's saying here? He's saying the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in you, he's talking to his disciples, will, uh, will give you instruction. And really, this is the preauthorization of the New Testament writers through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, but also... I think we can apply it to us. This is the Holy Spirit's illumination in the believer's heart so that we get spiritual understanding of the Scripture and spiritual insight into the Scripture so that we read, uh, for example, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20 uh, that, um, that we have an unction from God 
and we know all things. And he goes on to say in verse 27 that this unction that we have from God abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but we have this anointing that teaches you of all things and is of truth and no lie, even as, he, as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. What he's, he's talking about there is the Spirit of God gives insight and enables us to understand the scriptures. That's one reality of God's presence in us, his instruction. But notice in closing verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. The presence of God becomes real in the believing life through the Holy Spirit's indwelling. And that gives you instruction, as we just saw, but it also gives you emotion. Peace, it's called, in verse 27. The Holy Spirit within you, listen to this, He produces God's feelings inside of you. He produces God, he says, my peace. In other words, he produces in the believer the very peace that Jesus experienced when he walked this earth. You can have that same peace. It's supernatural. You're going to have Jesus' peace in your heart so that no matter what your circumstances are, you're totally unflappable. Paul calls it, calls it this, the peace that passes all understanding. The peace that is totally incomprehensible to us. It's supernatural. He says, you can claim that peace. That's what the Holy Spirit produces. He makes God so real to you that he gives you God's emotions in your heart. It's called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. When people know that they're going to die soon, and yet they're able to communicate, they often share their deepest thoughts and give their greatest blessing to their loved ones. That's exactly what Jesus is doing in these chapters. He's on his way to die. And so Jesus is sharing very important truth with his disciples. And he told them about his departure, but he also reveals to them how that was good news not only for them, but for us, for you, if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, you can be one. Jesus said it. We've already mentioned it. Verse 6. No man cometh unto the Father, Jesus said, but by me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just ask that you might continue to use this 14th chapter of John and the simple and yet profound thoughts that Jesus uh, gave us in our hearts. May we meditate on these things. And uh, may the profitability of it become apparent in our lives. May we have our minds and hearts really transformed as we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen.